it. You'll get it. All right, all right. Don't be hasty here. Yeah. I should I shouldn't have posted this so early. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, those high schoolers. Yeah. Gotta keep them in mind. Damn kids. All right, you guys. So um, this is a, a distribution of test scores. Okay. Um, they were pretty good. Let's see. 60, 70, 80. Okay, so this is under. So if you're in one of these, that means you're under that score. So three people <coughs> got between 90 and 100. They were under 100. Right, so that means that most people are here. So these are from 50 to 90. No, yeah. 50. Wait, is that 50? No, no, yeah, 50. 50 to, <coughs> this is under 90. So 90, yeah, 50 to 90. All right? So most people are in there. That's a pretty good looking bell curve in my opinion. All right, normal curve. And some people didn't do so well and some people aced it. So, good job. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you got a pretty good grade. You're in here. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, average 69 and a half. That's like hovering just under B, right? 70. And median 71.3. It's about the same, right? So that's a B, okay? So low B. Okay, so now that you guys know what you guys got, then don't be too worried if you got below average because there's one more test, all right? And that test is worth almost two times more than this. All right, so final, it's cumulative, so you have to know everything in here. And of course it's cumulative because, you know, it's a final exam of a course and if you learn the stuff in the course, oh, then this, you have the, to know. this is the final exam? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 the final's going to be cumulative. I thought you were talking about another midterm. No, if there are another midterm, midterm, it would not be. No, other midterms would be based off that unit. Right? Midterm, but the yeah. final, there's only one midterm in this class because it's so short, and the final is cumulative, right? So you guys have to make sure you know everything. But at the same time, it's really important that you know everything because we're done talking about animals almost, all right, and organisms. We're going to start talking about ecosystems and it's really important that when we cover organisms in there, that you'll be able to recognize them. You know, right off the bat, it's like, oh, I know the phylum, I know the class. Right? It's really important that you can recognize them. Okay, so that's so what we got. If you got a little bit below, then it basically means you need to step up the studying. All right, so make sure you guys just step it up. We got the video, we got the lecture slides online. Okay. When I was like studying, so I went to yeah. And so my setting was like telling up processes on like how shells are made and how cat crabs fall and stuff like that. Was it correct? I mean, Apparently. Some, some of it. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, most of it because like I only taught them about the crabs and the. Oh, cat. oh, you told them about it and they were reading it back to you. No, 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 no. Like I was explaining what happens. Oh, oh, I see. You were explaining to them. Oh, yeah, I guess. And then they were actually getting pretty interested. Oh, okay, like, nice. Like, well, yeah. very good. There you go. So we have like multiple small main body classes going on on the side, right? <laughs> okay, well, good. I'm glad you were teaching your friends. Okay, so yeah, um, just, you know, step up the studying. If you guys got above, then you kind of know what to do, right? Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to be okay. All right, for those of you guys a little bit below, this is a good time to just like reset and start a new unit. Just start studying now in a way different from that you were before. Something like that. <coughs> okay? And hopefully it all works out. Okay? Any questions? Are very good? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So before I continue, I actually want to tell you something about what I did this weekend. Um, I didn't do that much marine stuff, but I did have a friend come over from Maryland, and we went to Manhattan Beach together. Do you guys know Manhattan Beach? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? What, what's that Manhattan Beach? Um, I've only been to Dino. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you, do you there's remember? food. <laughs> there is food, but what about at, at the actual beach? Uh, the volleyball. Oh, wait, wait. I have Google Maps open right here. Right. Okay, so here's Hermosa Beach, right? Oh, Manhattan Beach is right here. See? Look, there's a, there's a pier. Uh, See, what's oh, at the end of the pier? Oh. And an aquarium, right? A roundhouse aquarium. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't been here for a while, and I know that last year they were doing, um, Modeling on it, mm -hmm. so it's closed off. But 
but I finally went in because it finished probably half a year ago or so, and I checked it out, and I hate it now. <laughs> I hated it. It was yeah. terrible. I hate it. it was terrible. Yeah, this place used to be so cool. I used to come here all the time when I was a kid. Wow. I do like once every two weeks. Very and cool. it's, it's free, right? It's mm. awesome. It's this little building that's the size of like two classrooms. Okay, it's not very big at all. But when you walk inside, you're like, whoa, this place is big. And then it's just surprising how many aquariums they can fit in such a small space. And it was spacious too on the inside. It wasn't like crowd or anything, and there's an upstairs section, and it was it was pretty cool. I really liked it. Okay, so I walk into this one, and it no longer gives me that feeling of, you know, being spacious. It was really claustrophobic mm. and tight, and there were they they took out aquariums. Like I think there was less. There was less inside, and I don't know, like. I would have to say that before, 90% of the square feet inside was used for aquariums and stuff, exhibits. Mm -hmm. But now, it looks like only about 60%. And they made the office space bigger, and they also have an extra section on the side with a lot of, like, the extra room for um, equipment and stuff, like fish care equipment, like a mm -hmm. very, literally expensive aquarium to clean, maintenance clean stuff. Up, yeah, exactly. Maintain. Yeah, and they have a really big section on that, so it kind of makes like the fish and the employees more comfortable, I guess. But the aquarium itself is not that great anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you've never been there before, then good. I recommend checking it out and it'll probably be okay. But if you haven't been there before, it sucks now. Mm -hmm. So that's what I guess. Well, that's a little too bad. But yeah, anyways, um, Grunion Run. Did your friend like it? Did my friend like it? Well, I don't know because I was complaining a little. No. <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever he said, I wasn't paying attention. I was complaining the whole time. <laughs> this place sucks. Man. No, I literally said that twenty times yesterday. Aww. Yeah, I I don't know what he was saying, but I just kept saying, man, I just I just hate this place now. <laughs> like an employee walked out and I asked him, Did you start working here before or after the renovation? And then he said, Oh, I just got here like a couple months after they finished it again. And I was like, Oh, so you don't know how I used to be. <laughs> he, he asked me. Yeah, because it sucks now. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't say that. But then he asked me, oh, what's wrong with it? And then like, I paused for like 30 seconds. I was like, it sucks now. <laughs> oh, man. I hate it now. Like, yeah. It's just not that great. Oh. But if you've never been there before, it's probably pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, so anyways. Um, oh, and, and now they have like high-tech donation things. Like before, they just had a small, innocent you know, out of the Put way donation in. box. Yeah, but now they have like, swipe your credit card on the wall. They have three of them. One for $5, one for 10, one for 25. Wow. wow. Yeah, I can't believe it, it's crazy. Yeah, I don't know, they spend more. But I think they do that everywhere now. Probably, yeah, but I don't know, it, it's, it's unsightly in my opinion. Yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be a free aquarium. Okay, you guys, let's, let's get on with this. So, uh, we ended our discussion last week before the test on reptilia, right? Mm -hmm. And here are just like four modern day examples of marine reptiles, okay? And this is what we have now. And here's some examples of what we used to have, right? Ichthyosaur, plesiosaur, mosasaur, um, prehistoric dinosaurs that lived in the ocean, okay? Mm -hmm. Marine dinosaurs. Okay, well, dinosaurs, our knowledge of dinosaurs comes solely from their remains, right? Their fossils. So let's just say that we find fossils like this, right? This is a terrestrial dinosaur. And it's like a type of raptor. Mm -hmm. Now, what do some scientists think they can see on this raptor besides the bones? Feathers. It's these little interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting body covering, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, what, what could those be? Well, maybe they're feathers. Scale. They look like them, but we'll never know because obviously, right, it's just a rock. So you'll never be able to figure out what they are, but they look like them. And later down the line, we might find other fossils that look like this, kind of like dinosaur-ish, but more of those body coverings here, right? This is an extinct, <clears throat> like half dinosaur, half, I'll tell you later, right? That had feathers or probably feathers, right? We're not sure. And it looks like wings, in this case. And then, of course, it leads to um, more modern fossils that look like 
birds. Okay, mm -hmm. so here's a evolutionary progression that is really important to know because, you know, we say the dinosaurs went extinct, right? Well, sort of. Uh, most of the dinosaurs went extinct, but one branch of dinosaurs actually stayed alive, and they are the birds. birds, right? So what I'm trying to say is birds technically are dinosaurs. They're just the one branch that survived until now. The rest mm -hmm. of them went extinct. Okay, and that kind of explains why the bird lineage comes off the reptiles. Remember we saw that in the phylogeny? We have all those things branching off the main branch of the phylogeny, but the birds come from the reptiles. And that's exactly what happened, right? We'd, we'd say birds evolved from reptiles, ancient dinosaurs, most of them went extinct. Okay, so this is the sixth class, class Aves, right? Maybe Ave, it doesn't, it's not exactly bird, but it um, has a lot to do with birds, right? Um, apes, right? Like avian, right? Avian, or avian, aviation, right? Avian flu, you know, stuff like that. Aves, okay. Class Aves is a class of birds, right? So let's take a look at the features that this bird has, right? This is a great blue carrion, and we'll see what features it has. Okay, what features do they have left over from back when they were reptiles? Well, they lay calcareous eggs. Is that true? Can we all verify that? No. Yeah, because I mean, what sample animal do we interact with a lot with those calcareous eggs? Chicken. The chicken. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It's a bird. So, got those calcareous eggs. And um, what do you know about calcareous eggs again? They're sensitive. Like they can break easy. Okay, they 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 are delicate. But yeah. what, tell me something good about them. Oh. Yeah. Why is this a you can, lay them on land. you can lay them on land, right? Okay, just remember, frog eggs cannot be laid on land because they're too soft. watery. Not, not the softness, it's they will dry up, right? They're watery, they don't have a shell, so you have to lay them in the water. But reptiles solve that problem with the calcareous egg shells, so you lay them on land, okay? Are these good for marine organisms? No. No, no. no. okay? Remember, we saw the problem the sea turtle has, but we're going to see soon enough how the bird deals with that problem as well. Okay, and the second thing you can add on, it has lungs, and I didn't write it, but it has limbs too, right? So let's add in some of these things under aves. Does it have jaws? Yes, easy. Yes. Breathing structures, lungs. lungs. Skeleton, everything now has a full bone skeleton. Right, okay. Uh, movement, we'll put limbs here for movement. Body covering, reproduction. Okay, reproduction, right? Land eggs. There we go. Okay, we can fill in those so far and we'll tack on the rest of them as we go through this. All right. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> birds came, came from reptiles, right? Which reptiles? Dinosaurs, right? Um, so they're not as scary as the dinosaurs, right? They seem to have lost their teeth. <coughs> um, they have what's called a, a bill, or normal people call it a beak, right? And Birds don't have teeth inside, right? It's just that they swallow their food whole, um, drink nectar usually, right? But um, what do birds bring to the table that makes them so different from reptiles that we decide to put them in a different class, right? Feathers. That is one thing, right? But we have to talk about why feathers even came about, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, clearly you guys noticed some cosmetic differences. This thing has scales, scales right? Yes. Reptiles have scales so they can live on land, but birds have covered their scales with feathers instead, right? Um, that is true, right? We will talk about why in, in a second, right? But the main difference that I wanna point out is they are now warm-blooded. Warm -blooded. Okay, they're not the first warm-blooded creatures out there. Okay, there's another, the other class that we haven't talked about yet is the first, but this is the first one that we're gonna talk about, right? Birds are warm-blooded, they're endothermic, right? Warm blood, okay. What does warm bloodedness mean compared to a cold blooded animal? Right. A cold blooded animal does not regulate its body temperature, but its warm blooded animal does. Right? What do I mean by regulate its body temperature? I mean it tries to keep it warm all the time. All right? Regulate means you want to keep it at a stable temperature, and in this case, at a stable like 98 degrees F. Right? Um, you want to keep it at a stable 37 degrees C. Just as stable. And then if it goes above, you'll try to cool down. If it goes below, you'll try to go up. You regulate it to that level and stay that warm level. Cold blood 
blooded animal does not regulate its body temperature, right? A cold blooded animal just goes with the flow, right? It's at the mercy of the outside te environmental temperature. Well, here's a warm blooded animal. If they ever get too cold, then they will put in extra energy to generate heat to warm themselves back up, all right? They will put in the extra effort to do that, all right? So that's what it means to be warm blooded. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all birds, right? Birds are generating their heat so they can stay warm. And why would they want to do that? All right, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so let's compare a cold-blooded animal versus a warm-blooded animal. Here's a sea turtle, here's a seagull, right? The cold-blooded animal, right? If it is cold outside, then what will happen to you, what will happen to the cold-blooded animal? Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe it will search for warmth. But like, what will happen to the body temperature? It'll, it'll, go, down. it'll, be fine. it'll go down. It'll go down. Yeah, because remember, cold blood animals do not control the temperature. They will go with the flow. Oh, I see. Right. So if it's cold outside, then they will just end up being cold. Right. Whatever. Yeah. But the warm blooded animal will work hard to stay warm even though it's cold. Okay. This costs energy. Mm -hmm. Right. Food energy. This costs energy. So. Um, the cost is the cold-blooded animal actually gets to conserve energy, whereas the warm-blooded animal uses it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, in order to be warm-blooded and constantly generate that heat, you will need to consume a lot of energy. Right? Like mice, they're always eating. Right? Why are they always looking for something to eat? Because, you know, if they don't, they don't have enough energy to maintain their body temperature, and they will actually starve. Cold blood animals, on the other hand, conserve energy because they don't care what body temperature they're at, right? So that's why you get a bunch of cold blood animals who can go weeks without food, right? And they're okay. Mammals and birds and stuff, they're on the brink of starvation after a couple weeks without food. But reptiles, they're, that, that's like normal for them, right? They eat one big meal and they rest, they uh, go lie dormant for a long time because they're, they don't use that much energy. Right, they conserve energy very, very well. Okay, so how can we mitigate the use of energy? Right, let's think about this scenario. Remember, the reason why we didn't talk about warm or cold bloodedness until now is that in the ocean, it is not like efficient or feasible to be warm blooded. If you're in the ocean and the water is cold, you should just be cold blooded to save energy. Right, that's why there's very few warm blooded animals in the ocean, most of them are cold blooded. It's because, you know, the water's cold. You cannot fight the cold ocean, right? But if you're warm-blooded, you will try to fight the cold ocean foolishly, right? So let's just say the cold ocean cools you down, you're warm-blooded, so you will automatically use energy to generate heat to warm yourself back up. Water cools you down again. What's gonna happen? Using more you're gonna use more energy to warm yourself back up because that's just what your body does. You don't even control it, it's involuntary, right? Well, the ocean is so cold, it just cools you down again, so then now you're gonna waste a lot of energy, right? That is very inefficient, mm -hmm. okay? So, it would be way better if you didn't have to constantly regenerate that heat. So, in an effort to preserve this energy, you need to preserve the initial heat that you generate the first time, all right? And one way to do so is with an insulative body covering. What was it again? Feathers. Feathers. Yes, exactly, right? So feathers on the bird were mainly evolved to, you know, insulate against heat loss, right? You want to insulate against heat loss so that you generate the heat once, the ocean doesn't cool you down as fast, or the environment doesn't cool you down as fast, and that way you don't have to generate heat over and over. Does that make sense, right? You only have to generate, generate heat like once, and then you can use your feathers to keep the heat, right? This is in stark contrast to reptiles that have scales, right? Scales is actually very, very bad at retaining heat. They lose heat, they're good at retaining water, okay? That's why they have it, but they're bad at retaining heat. They lose heat quickly, so it actually makes reptiles really suitable for deserts where it's too hot, right? Um, mammals and birds that live in the desert have a tough time because their body is generating heat from the inside, but the sun is beating down on the outside. Now you're overheating, right? So it's actually not good to be warm-blooded in the desert. Right? Okay, so let's add that in. To body covering, we now have 
feathers on top, right? We have feathers now because we are trying to prevent heat loss. If we don't prevent heat loss, then this bird is gonna continue regenerating heat, and if it does that, it will use more energy, right? To conserve energy and only generate heat a set few number of times, then it will try to prevent the heat loss, so it doesn't have to keep doing it, okay? All right, so far it sounds like warm-bloodedness comes at some heavy costs, right? Energetic costs, and that is true, Warm-bloodedness is only feasible if you have a lot of food available. If you don't have that much food available, it is better to be cold-blooded. All right. So, what are the benefits of warm blood? All right. Well, here's the thing. If your blood is warm and your muscles are warm, then you can be active. You can be fast. What do athletes do before they do the warm exercise? Up. They warm up. Exactly. And that's not a phrase. That's legit. Right? They literally had warmed themselves up so their muscles perform at peak efficiency, right? Muscles do not perform very well when they are cold, right? So they do well when the blood is warm, right? Uh, when blood is warm, their metabolism rises, they're able to exert more energy, and therefore they are capable of high intensity activities. They're very fast, they're very strong, and in contrast, cold blood animals are thought of as usually being much slower, right? So you think of like, maybe some reptiles, you know, they're capable of short bursts, but not sustained, right? Their muscles are cold. Okay, so warm blood animals, capable of going too fast. Yeah, very fast, very strong, cold-blooded, usually not so much, right? So sometimes comes a scenario. How about you got a lizard and a mouse sleeping under a rock at night? Where it's cold. And then some predator comes by and flips that rock and wants to eat them both. Who do you think is going to be able to get away? The mouse. The mouse. Mm -hmm. Because it's warm blooded, it is ready to run away. Whereas the cold blooded lizard is too slow, yeah. right? It's cold right now. But even though they're both lying there in the cold night, the mouse is regularly buying comfort and keeping itself warm. So it will be able to escape in that instance, right? In general, I'd say if you're being chased, if a cold blood animal is being chased down by a warm blood animal, the warm blood animal will catch them. If the cold blood animal is chasing a warm blood animal, the warm blood animal could get away, right? Being warm blood is pretty good for survival. The only problem is it takes a lot of energy, right? So as long as you have that energy, then it's good to be warm blooded. If you don't have that energy, it's probably better to be cold. <clears throat> okay, so capable of high intensity activity. What, Intense activities, well, swimming is one thing, right? But Why? you see birds have unlocked a new novel form of locomotion. Flying. Flying, right? Something that is very rare in the animal kingdom. Insects do it, and um, very few mammals and reptiles do it. I think most of the flying reptiles are extinct, actually. But birds, we know birds, like, almost ubiquitously fly. Right? Flight. Flight is so hard. And you want to think about how hard flight is. I mean, this is a, a piece of muscle and bone, right? It's heavy, and yet it's defying gravity, right? See, like, we can defy gravity for, I don't know, like, like a fourth of a second or something, yes. you know? Like, like ah! <laughs> you know? I'm trying my best. I defy gravity just a little bit. But, you know, birds capable of their high intensity activity, they can fly, right? Flight is so impressive, you know, energetically impressive, right? They can lift themselves off the ground, up into almost weightless air, right? It's crazy. So, yeah, um, to help them do that, they got their warm blood, and they also have wings <coughs> now, right? So we can write wings in to their movement capabilities, right? So we got limbs and Limbs and wings. Birds can fly. Why is flying good? Well, could the could the sea turtle fly? No. What did the sea turtle do after it left the nest? Crawled back. Crawled back. Crawled back into the ocean, right? If it wanted to check on its eggs, what would it theoretically have to do? Crawl back. back on crawl back and then crawl back to the ocean. Difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you got the bird here laying calcareous eggs on land. It has to, right? 
Right. Because you can't lay calcareous eggs in the ocean. Well, the mother goes to the ocean, hunts, leaves the nest behind. But if she wants to check on it, easy or hard? Easy. 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 What does she do? Fly. Fly, fly, fly. fly back. You can fly back to your nest, right? Mm -hmm. Having warm blood and wings now enables you to lay your eggs on land, and you don't even have to worry about it, right? You don't have to worry about the fact that your nest is unattended because you can just fly back. Right? Plus, when you're a bird and you can fly, you can lay your eggs in novel locations. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking trees. like cliffs, trees, trees. Yeah. yeah, sides of cliffs, trees, yeah. higher up, hard to reach places. Who's going to be climbing those things to eat those eggs? Right? Other mm birds. -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I'd rather just go to the beach and dig up the sea turtle eggs. Right? Much easier. So they can also go to hard to reach places to lay their eggs. Right. All because wings, warm bloodedness, you know, allows them to fly and check on their nest. Okay, so that is a bird's way of fixing the egg problem. You guys see, so the reptilian egg problem in which you lay your eggs on land is no longer a problem for the aves because the aves they can fly. Right? And they would just check on their nest. Okay, so they solve the egg problem. That's good. Okay, so here's a little summary of class A's. We're not going to get too far into it, but you know, it's cool to know that we have an organism here that even though it is mostly terrestrial, even seabirds are mostly terrestrial. They mostly live on land, right? They might float around in the ocean and they might um, catch some fish, but they still usually return to their nest and sleep at night, right? They're still mostly terrestrial, but as far as most of the seabirds are concerned, right? Um, they are pretty successful at doing what they're doing, right? Checking on their nests, hunting in the ocean, <coughs> high intensity activities, and what okay. All right, so here are some examples of seabirds that we have. Does anybody recognize any of these? Penguin. Penguin, yeah, okay. Yeah, what else? Seagull, good, okay, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that one out. It's the most ubiquitous um, sea, uh, sea bird that we have here, yeah, white pelican. Is that one supposed to be a crane? Um, this one? Yeah. Oh, it is related to a crane. Um, it's, a, it's called a heron, right? Heron. A great blue heron. Um, herons are related to cranes, right? The blue-footed booby. The blue-footed booby, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm wondering if it has to do, deal with land crabs as well. Okay, so yeah, anyways, here's just a bunch of different seabirds. Right? They spend the majority of their life on land, but um, they do most of their hunting in the ocean, right? Um, we have these guys over here on our beaches, right? The rest of them are from other places. Is there a snowy egret? Uh, no, I did not uh, put an egret in here. But a snowy egret is not a seabird. Well, because when I went to the sea lion mm -hmm. place, Refuge thing. there yeah. was a snowy egret there and he was by all of them so I took a picture of him mm -hmm. and then I asked her what kind of bird is that because yeah. they look so pretty yeah yeah and she told me a snowy egret right right so those are aquatic birds mm -hmm. but they can also live on land right they usually just hunt insects near like rivers mm -hmm. and stuff yeah so they don't really go to the ocean very much but sometimes they go to like uh, an estuary you know like the salty brackish water yeah. near the ocean they're just hunting along the banks. They're kind of related to herons. Is the wandering albatross a seabird? Yeah, yeah, that one's definitely a seabird. Oh, yeah. right. They oh, live on God. cliffs. Are they pretty? Yeah. Um, pretty they pretty kind of look like seabirds. The feathers in the See, I took a picture of them. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's a good picture. <laughs> right there. So white. That one probably just wandered in there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, he was the only one there. That's why I asked her, what is that bird doing? <laughs> okay, so any questions on birds? Very good, what class is this called again? Apes. Apes, Apes. Apes. yeah. What, what phylum are we still in? Cordata. 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 Yeah, good. All right, you guys, so now let's move on to the last phylum. So we've covered all of these so far, right? We're almost ready for the last one. Mm -hmm. So let's name these off real quick. What is this? Agnatha. Yeah, Agnatha. 
Oysterdees. Oyster? Oysterdees. Oysterdees. And Vivian. Vivia. Reptilia. A's. I think I saw some of you guys reading that. No, it was right there, so. I don't know. But, anyways, are we clear on this now? Yes. What happened here? Where did they come from? Yeah, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Okay, so anyways, we're going to talk about our last one right now. But before we get into what this is called, which you already know probably. I do. Um, <laughs> what did these come from? Did they come from birds or reptiles? Um, Fish. I would say they came okay. from something like a reptile, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so they came from this, whatever this is. And reptiles also came. So they're not closely related to birds because birds, <coughs> came from you know, came from the yeah. reptile, right? So they came from this thing, which is also half related to a reptile, mm -hmm. right? We can look at these nodes, the part where they intersect. It's called a common ancestor, right? Mm -hmm. The common ancestor is something that turns into both of them, right? So the thing that the um, this group and the amphibians are most closely related to is whatever that is, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that this is, out of all of these, <coughs> the closest related to. It's going to be this because this thing is related to this as much as this is, and not this one, though. This one's related to that one. Right. Okay, so let's talk about that last group, right? We are finally on our last way, and remember, keep in mind that this is a progression towards being terrestrial, right? But then we're going to talk about their adaptations in the context of the marine environment. Right. So, last group, mammoths, right? We have sea lions, dolphins, whales, right? Course. Marine mammals. Okay, class mammalia. A big surprise here, right? Um, since they came from a reptile like creature, then we have some old reptilian features limbs and lungs. Okay, what are limbs and lungs good for again? Terrestrial, Terrestrial life, exactly. Because if you want to breathe on land, what should you have? Lungs. lungs. If you want to move around, what should you have? Limbs. Limbs. Yeah, exactly. If you want to breathe in the ocean, what should you have? Gills. 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 You should not have lungs, right? Lungs have a lot of problems in the ocean. And if you want to move around, you should have fins in the ocean, right? You should not have limbs usually. Okay, so lungs, full bone skeleton, right? You guys can verify that yourself, probably. Okay, um, movement, limbs. Okay, we'll fill in the rest as we go through. All right, so back from when we used to be reptiles, we had limbs and lungs. Okay, but what did mammals bring to the table? Well, first of all, the mammals have to go back to the ocean and deal with the fact that they have terrestrial adaptations. Their limbs have turned into fins, kind of paddles like the sea turtle, so that helps them a little bit. But the lungs, well, they didn't fix their lungs. They just learned how to hold their breath longer. They still have the same lung problems as before, right? What were the different problems with having lungs in the ocean? Not being able Not to dive, dive deeper. Yeah, you can't be dive as deep as like a fish could. You're vulnerable you when you go for breath. Vulnerable at the surface because you have to breathe air and stick your head above, right? Mm -hmm. What else? You're buoyant. Buoyant, exactly. It makes it really difficult to dive down because you got air sacs pushing you up. What else? You have to, you have to eat the gas. Oh yeah, so reptiles eat the gastrolus to counteract that, their buoyancy, exactly. Um, but yeah, so you got limited dive time, right? Because you always have to go back up, and then you have limited depth, as Leon said earlier there, so you can't go super deep. All right, so those are the same lung problems as before. The only way to mitigate that is just get better at holding your breath, right? Here's a question that I didn't ask earlier, but um, in terms of, uh, the holding your breath problem in order to try to dive deeper. Who do you think could hold their breath for longer? A marine reptile or a marine mammal? And I want you guys to think about this in terms of their blood. Reptile. Why that? Because it takes cold. less energy to not maintain heat. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so the reptile is not maintaining its body temperature, so it takes less energy. And so they can probably hold their breath for longer. Yeah, so marine reptiles are, or sorry, marine mammals have an added disadvantage of being warm-blooded because it needs to maintain that body temperature. 
right, if it wants to dive. All right, so let's move on and talk about other features, right? So you notice that we did not maintain the reptilian reproductive feature, whereas birds did, right? Mm -hmm. Birds retained the reptilian reproductive feature, but mammals did not. What was the reptilian reproductive feature? Eggs. Land eggs, mm -hmm. right? But mammals do not do that, right? How do mammals give birth? They Live skip birth. the eggs. Babies. They skip the eggs, exactly. <laughs> they skip the eggs and just have the fully fledged baby. Right, they give live birth. All right, and you guys can see here, we have killer whales and this beluga in captivity giving birth to a baby whale. All right, and the baby whale comes out, able to swim. You don't need to have a nest. You don't need to watch over the eggs and wait for it to hatch. It just comes out swimming. So this is actually a good way to have babies in the ocean. All right, if you don't lay water eggs like sharks do, then this is a good way to, you know, reproduce in the ocean, mm -hmm. live birth, right? Yes. So do the babies come out with like a full, like lung full of air, or? Oh man, that's a good question. <laughs> but um, the answer is, um, it's actually a lung full of liquid, amniotic fluid, right? So you, know, I don't, I don't know if you've not, you've never, right? You never watch a baby coming out of a mother, right? I but did. what the doctor does is it takes the this is called a pipette. A pipette. Yeah, it takes a pipette and sucks the liquid out of the baby's mm -hmm. lungs. Oh. Yeah. So that its lungs are clear and it doesn't drown. Yeah. So if you imagine, like, it's coming from a womb that has the amniotic fluid and then it's going to the ocean, which is also water, it is still holding its breath at the time. So as soon as the umbilical cord is cut, then it needs to go up to the surface. My granddaughter had a hard time. Um, coming from the womb. Mm, I see. But it's okay, as long as the umbilical cord is still attached, mm -hmm. the baby will survive, yeah. right? Because it's getting fresh oxygen from the mother, right? Okay, so we can add on the reproductive method, live birth. All right, live birth, this kind of, actually, you know what? This solves the problem of land eggs, right? You don't have to come onto land to lay eggs, and you don't have to worry about your nest being raided. Okay, you have some offspring that come out fully fledged, right? You just have other worries. What was that? You have other worries now. You have other worries now, yeah. okay. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the worries of having babies like this. Well, for one, this baby comes out fully fledged, right? It has all the organs, all the development is pretty much finished. It's just a small version of the adult. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? Well, when you lay an egg like a reptile or a bird, that egg that first gets laid out, if you cracked it open, the embryo is still developing. It, yeah. When you crack the egg open as soon as it's born, it will not be able to survive. The baby inside of the egg needs time to develop and feed off of the yolk, all right? So that's what happens when you lay an egg. You lay an egg and you let the baby develop off of its own yolk supply for however long it takes, right? In this case, the mother is constantly supplying energy, no yolk, to the baby to develop inside her body. So the mother acts as the eggshell mm. for the baby, all right? So the mother acts as the yolk source, energy source. So if the mother is providing energy rather than providing a little free energy packet for the baby, it just comes straight like a parasite from the mother, then how many babies do you think the mother can support like this? Off of her whole own body. Just a few, yeah. right? If you want to lay eggs and give each egg a little energy packet, you can have a bunch, right? Think about turtles, 50 to 100 eggs, yeah. right? Think about crabs, million eggs, right? Give each egg a little energy packet and you're good, that's it. You, have, you get your own energy, don't take any of mine, right? But when you keep live babies inside your body and feed off your own energy source, you can only a feed, a feed a few at a time. All right, so consequently, most mammals don't have that many babies. They only have a couple, All right? So if you only have a couple babies, then you better hope they're good. You don't wanna waste those opportunities. If you're a crab and you have a million babies, then you don't really care that much, and you're going for quality or quantity over quality, right? You just hope that some of them make it, and you just, you see the mother just let them go and the fish were eating it. 
right? No parental investment. Mm. But in this case, you only have a couple offspring and you don't want them to fail. You want just these few to succeed. And so the mothers invest a lot of time and energy into raising their offspring. Mammals take care of their offspring because they don't have that many. They want to make sure these ones make it, right? This is the textbook example of putting all your eggs into one basket, right? You literally want this one to succeed. If you had a bunch of offspring, you, like a crab, you wouldn't care as much. But in this case, you are going for quality over quantity. You only have a few, so you're going to take care of them and make sure it all works out. Okay, so mammals, they take care of their offspring because by doing live birth, it takes so much energy out of the mother that you can only have a few. And if you only have a few, then you can't afford to have bad ones. So you just hope they're all good, right? You put in a lot of energy to make sure they're all good. Okay, so mammals, they take care of their offspring because they only have a few. Right. <clears throat> now, if, if the baby comes out sick or something's wrong with it, do yeah. they discard it? Like, um, do you know? I don't know, actually. Um, um, I know for humans, we don't do that um, anymore, at least. Yeah. Um, for, as for wild animals, would they, you know, disown sick offspring? I have no idea. I've seen a video where yeah. deer will do that, they'll leave the... Really? Like the, it was, it was limping. Yeah. And um, the, the mother deer wanted to... Oh, okay. She tried to, but after a while, she just left. Do mothers abandon oh, yeah. their babies? I've seen that one before. Babies. Like, so the deer baby couldn't stand up anymore? Yeah. So the mother leaves and just abandons the, uh, the baby. Uh, I think you gotta no. put animals in there. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. I, I saw it. I saw yeah. it. <laughs> Worst mothers and animals. Um, okay. Let's see. Shortly after birth, uh, variations between domestics. Some okay, large reject mammals will really reject the second. Insurance infant. They do not have the means. Uh, that's that's different. That's completely different yeah. from what you're saying. Um, okay, this is saying that it is possible that that happens. Yeah. But maybe not always, right? Mm. They almost always kill the pet's cousins, not biological related. See, that's different again. There's this okay. case on Facebook called the Dodo. Yeah. Have you guys ever heard? The Dodo, the extinct bird. The, well, the thing is it's called the Dodo. Oh, but it's not about the extinct No, it's not about birds. It okay. just talks about how people help other animals. And, oh, okay. And I saw that video because um, a guy actually helped the, the, the baby deer. He watched over it until it was able to walk. Ah, uh, I see. Oh, then, I see. The, the one that was abandoned. Yeah. So that's why I found the video because... Maybe, uh, maybe, did it have any other offspring? Yeah, it had another offspring. Yeah, so that's probably why, because the other one... The other it, one was it, able to walk okay. Yeah, so it only had the ability to nurse one of them. That's what most of these articles yeah, are saying. Yeah, it's saying that. Yeah, so maybe it's when the mother realizes that it doesn't have any resources to, yeah, for true. both of them. Because they both, you know, producing milk is energy. Well, I was just wondering, like, if, if it comes out sick or something, like, say they give two and one comes out sick... Yeah. Do they only go to the one that's actually healthy? Oh, I see, I see. Well, I think it probably happens sometimes. Or do they let some? Yeah, it happens, yeah. So yeah. the short answer is yes. The long answer is um, I'm sure there's others that don't do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, like, if one is sick, usually what happens in the nat animal kingdom is natural selection will just take care of it. Mm -hmm. They'll just get rid of it pretty soon. It's not nothing on the mother's part. It'll probably just get eaten sometime yeah so whether the mother abandons it or not it probably will not make it anyways okay. right. but yeah I'm, I'm it happens yes okay so um continuing on right um these guys are warm-blooded right we all know that mammals are warm-blooded you guys are warm-blooded constant body temperature 37 degrees c right okay warm blood what was the cost of being warm-blooded again a lot of energy uses energy mm -hmm. okay and what is the way that birds have figured out not to 
we t uh, not to use so much energy in generating heat. Feathers. Feathers, right? Because if you gen have feathers and you only generate heat once, you keep that heat around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we don't have feathers. Fur. Mammals, as you guys can see, fur. we got their hair, hair and fur, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So fur is a good way to conserve heat so you don't have to generate it that many times, right? So let's put that here over mammalian body covering and we have warm blood. Okay, oh, well, we've got a complete chart now, or a complete table. Make sure you guys have this table down. Actually, you know what? We can add one more thing to it, but that's basically it. Okay, so having fur, right, for the same reason. Everybody good with that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not all mammals have fur, actually. There are some that have, don't have fur, right? Marine mammals in particular, some of them don't have fur. I'm talking about whales, right? Whales and walruses, they don't have fur, so what do they use instead for warmth? Uh, they got their fat, okay. blubber, right? They have a blubber, blubber that allows them to conserve warmth, right? Does <clears throat> blubber count as a body covering? No. Uh, not really, huh? Only in time. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, let's just not put it on. I was going to put it on there, but <coughs> that's fine. That's good. Yeah. Uh, it's not a good question. Trick question? No, no, no. I don't want to make that. That's unfair, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, blubber. Uh, let's just leave that out of the table. But... It's good to know, though, that blubber doubles as another insulating mechanism, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, not just insulating against, you know, cold, it also functions as, you know, a flotation device, right? Blubber is made out of fats and lipids, and those are less dense than water. So if you have enough, you can float, right? And in consequence, since ocean has the buoyant force of water, plus the fact that they got blubber to help them float, you're able to be huge in the ocean, right? I think these examples are over here, um, right? Really, really big animals in the ocean. The ocean supports the biggest animals because, you know, we got the buoyant force of the ocean. They're not affected by gravity, right? On land, you're affected by gravity and you're only allowed to be about this big. This is the biggest land animal, mm -hmm. right? Any bigger and gravity becomes too hard for its bones and muscles to support its weight and it's just not very efficient anymore, right? But in the ocean, you can be really big in the ocean because the water will help support your weight, right? And it helps that they have blood, blubber, right? The blubber will keep them afloat in the ocean. <clears throat> okay, so here we have some seals, right? Sea lions, and this is a whale. They're all huge. Blue whale is the biggest animal in the world. And it makes sense that the biggest animal in the world lives in the ocean. If something this big were to live on land, well, it wouldn't do so well, right? Um, when whales get sick, they end up beached on the shore, mm -hmm. right? Okay, things get beached on the shore because they become too weak to fight the waves in the current, so the waves mm -hmm. just wash them up, okay? And they're too weak to swim back. Okay, well, you're just thinking, well, what's the big deal? Whales have lungs, they breathe air. It should be all right, right? It's not like you put a cat in the water and it can't breathe the water. This is a whale on land. It can breathe the air, right? What's the big deal? Well, here's the thing. Where are your lungs located? Right here? Mm -hmm. On your what surface of your body? Chest. What surface is it? Oh, the... the Where the lungs look in on the, the bottom? Oral? Not the aboral. No, it's the uh, posterior <laughs> and the aboral. Not the posterior. Not the other uh, option. Uh, I mean, yeah, but let, let's use the body position that we talked about in the class. We have posterior and anterior, and we had... Oral. No, 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 that's something we used to describe radially symmetric organisms. Right. Um. No, we do. Remember this side and this side? Mm -hmm. The opposite of dorsal. Yeah, the opposite of dorsal. What was it? Come on. Oh. Oh, that's why you said pectoral. I get it. Or the shark jumping. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Pectoral fins. Dorsal. Ventral. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, anyways, whatever. The the lungs are on your <laughs> ventral surface, right? Okay. Well, if the lungs are on your ventral surface, this whale is lying on the beach. Guess what? It oh. is so heavy. <laughs> it crushes it's, it's, its own lungs. lungs. Yeah, without the buoyant force of the water holding the rest of its body up, 
it crushes its lungs. If its lungs want to expand, it has to push its whole body up. Right? Mm. If, if the whale were lying on its back, it would actually be better. Okay. But unfortunately, I also want to work for a whale because it's blue all over the time. Oh. <laughs> it can't breathe. Yeah, so when a whale gets beached, it will suffocate under its mm. own weight, right? So animals this big cannot live on land usually, right? They have to live in the ocean, right? They gotta live in the ocean and be supported by all of the water in general. Is it bad for the ocean because then the bacteria would, would start to accumulate? Like accumulate? So it depends on if it gets eaten by scavengers or not, right? Oh, I um, see. I would have to say that it's actually better if it dies on land than in the ocean. Yeah. There's oh. more bacteria in the ocean right. than mm -hmm. on land, right? The bacteria will get to it faster if it died in at the sea, okay. right? If it died on land, it'll get eaten slower, but, but um, the bacteria won't get to it as fast. Um, so it won't be anoxic, right? You will not be worried about anoxia, right? And also, like, since air, air moves really quickly, in general, you don't have to be worried about anoxic air. You only have to be worried about anoxic water, mm -hmm. right? Because water doesn't move quite as fast, right? On land, if it dies on land, you would probably be worried about diseases spreading. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about the normal problem with anoxia. I've actually seen a dead whale before, like a few months ago. Oh, really? Nasty. Yeah, yeah, it was nasty. It was in San Francisco. Yeah. Oh. yeah, there was like a gray whale washed up onto a beach, and it was at a spot that I was diving in. I had to walk by it like four <laughs> times. It was How so big was it? It was like 40 feet. Wow. It was big, yeah. yeah it was That's actually small. How did they, what did they do? Well, for a gray whale, yeah. it's pretty good size. What was that? What did they do to take, take it out? And um, I don't think they did anything. Actually, because my friend who lives there told me, gave me updates, and he said, "Oh, part of it's gone now. Um, now it's mostly just bones scattered." So I don't think they did anything. I think like every time the high tide came in, you know, it washed part of it away. Oh. You know, and maybe it started breaking up on its but own. But scientists wouldn't go and like take some of the bones to try to figure out what caused it. They probably would, but I, I'm just guessing nobody reported it mm. and oh, cared see. enough. So yeah. Does it create a smell? Yeah, it was nasty. Yeah. <laughs> nasty. Rotten meat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was nasty. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So there, was a, there was a dead whale there. It was pretty nasty. Right. Okay, so anyways, um, everybody okay with this? Okay, so since they live in the water with the buoyant force and the blubber, they can support their weight. But if they come on the land, then they will actually die despite the fact that they breathe air. Right? Okay, cool. So whales are big. All good. <laughs> Okay, cool. So let's look into some examples of some marine mammals, right? The first one we're going to talk about are pinnipeds, all right? They include seals, sea lions, and walruses, right? These things, um, everybody gets these two confused, but they're actually different animals, right? Do you guys know what the differences are? Seals, sea lions. Hey, it sucks that their names are so close, right? They look so similar. Don't they have arms? Is it the way they eat? Um, the arms probably, and the but um, more yeah. of like cosmetic things, right? So first of all, they you look at the face of the right. sea lion, they got ears, right? Mm -hmm. They have ears and the seal does not. They, the seal only has like holes on the side of its head for ears. Um, it's got big back flippers, right? Mm -hmm. It's two hind limbs. The two hind limbs here are shorter, but it's two forelimbs are longer, right? <coughs> the forelimbs are long paddles, right? These are short paws, oh, yeah. right? So <clears throat> because of its long paddle like forearms, it can crawl onto land and like waddle, right? Waddle back and forth. But the seal has a hard time on land with its short limbs, so it has to like hobble around, kind of like undulating like a worm, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, these things, they just like all around, right? They, they're not, yeah, scooch, exactly. They're not very good at moving around on land, where sea lions actually can move a little bit on land, right? Waddle. Waddle, yeah. Slowly, but better than seals can. So seals are more vulnerable because they're not, they don't have big, because I can, I can imagine that the sea lions 
a better swimmer? Uh, the sea lion is uh, more agile, yeah, than the seal, oh, okay. right? Sure. Um, this is a lot faster. But I mean, seals are pretty, you know, they're pretty good swimmers as well. Um, sea lions, I wouldn't be surprised if they're a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, pinnipeds, right? Pinniped is um, sort of it's like a taxonomic classification. It's a level that we're not going to talk about too much. It's the infra order, basically, and what that means is like domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. So between order and family, oh. the infra order, pinniped, right? So we're not going to worry too much about the infra order, but just know what pinniped means, right? Where we're talking about sea lions, right? Seals, walrus seals, stuff like that. Can you ask these guys? Do you know um, how to say seal in French? Seal? No, it's not. It's, oh, I know. I was just thinking of it's a uh, It's book. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's spelled like this. Right? I think that's how you spell it. Oh, like in French, boca? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like boca. Yeah, so I don't know, you know, it sounds like a very familiar word, I guess. <laughs> okay, so sea lions, right? We're not going to talk too much about sea lions, but I do want to examine their diet. So let's look at this. This is a leopard seal, a very aggressive seal in the Arctic, right? And look at his teeth, right? Obviously carnivore. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think it eats based off your knowledge of shark teeth? Fish. fish. What kind fast of fish? fish? Fast fish. Fast. Slippery. 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 How big? Not bigger than a mouth. Yeah, yeah, small. <laughs> small, fast, slippery fish. Exactly, right? That's what they like to eat. Why? Because they got pointed teeth. Pointed teeth are good for catching. Holding, catching. Ball, right? Holding. Stabbing, oh. holding things like a fork, right? So there you go. They're catching little, small, slippery fish. Nothing huge, because if it were huge, what would it eat? Serrated. Serrated, right? To cut it off. But no, these are good for hunting instead of holding small ones. Okay, so that's like normal seals and sea lions, right? What about this? This is a crab eater seal. Okay. Um, judging by its name, it eats crabs apparently. Um, that's a, kind of a misnomer, right? Let's just say if it did eat crabs, what kind of teeth would it have? Blunt. Blunt, right? Like a horn shark you guys or a ray. Okay, to crush crabs. But no, they don't actually eat crabs. They eat this um, krill, which is a shrimp like organism. Um, it kind of makes sense because they're in the same phylum, I guess, right? What phylum is this? Um, Arthropoda. Arthropoda, right? Okay, they're in the same phylum as crabs are, so it kind of makes sense. But this is not a crab. It's it's not that hard, right? Um, mm -hmm. Instead, it's tiny and it exists as a plankton, so it's floating around in the water. What is the usual way to catch plankton? Filter feeding. Filter feeding. Could you imagine a seal filter feeding? <laughs> Now that is strange, right? How does a seal go about filter feeding? Right? Funny, Funny teeth. Funny looking teeth. Funny, oh, you saw the lecture, right? Funny looking teeth, exactly, right? Let's look at his teeth. Mm -hmm. Oh, right? wow. His teeth look like this. Really crazy teeth with holes in it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So maybe it's you can like imagine coral. it gets a mouthful of water. Hopefully that water has some krill in it. And then it spits out the water with its teeth closed. And the water comes out of the holes, but and it keeps the, the, the krill yeah, stays behind. Oh, oh okay. It swallows that. So it's filter feeding with its teeth. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of like using a net, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, no. Well, filter feeding is defined as using a net. Oh, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. But it's okay. No, you, you put two and two together. We got it now, right? Now we know what, now, now why you're like, oh, that's why he keeps saying net, right? <laughs> okay, so yes. Um, Filter feeding teeth. Right? Okay, so anyways, that's pretty much about it for pinnipeds I want to get into. Um, everybody good with this? <coughs> yeah. Okay, so let's get into the other marine mammal, right? Very popular group, cetaceans. Right? Cetacean is another infra order and it refers to whales. Okay, the two types of whales. They're classified by what's in their mouth. Baleen whales, toothed whales. Right? Baleen whales, they've got the baleen in mouth right here toothed whales has a mouthful of teeth, and as you'll notice, toothed whales are just dolphins, right? Just dolphins. Okay, so dolphins are a type of whale. What kind of whale? A toothed whale, right? Okay. Okay, so we'll talk about baleen whales first. Do you have a question? Uh, so it's, it's 
Citations are just whales. Citations are that it's an info order that means whales. Yeah, okay. all whales are in this group. Right. Um, it includes whales, dolphins, porpoises, and something called like a grampus. I don't know. That might be a porpoise too. But. Okay. So whales. So let's talk about the baleen whales first. Baleen whales have baleen in their mouth. Right. These are not teeth. Oh. They look like teeth. More like oh, hair. It's like hair. Yeah, it's yeah. more like hair. More like, like a horse broom. hair. Like a broom, yeah, right. Horse hair, maybe, yeah. No, I mean, these things are actually, it's not hairy, though. Like like this kind of hair, like flimsy. This is actually um, tough. So, um, broom is actually a pretty good oh, yeah. um, way because the broom bristles are really tough. They're mm -hmm. like, when you put your hand down them, they don't bend like easy. You put a little bit of force on them. Like your hair just crushes down like easy, right? So, it's kind of like that but it, it's really actually tough, right? So, like, plastic, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of has like, that type of consistency. So, you look at, like, they're kind of closely spaced together, right? This is bowhead whale, these are gray whales. It takes a big mouthful of water, it spits the water out through the baleen mm -hmm. in order to do what? Filter. 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 Catching all the little plankton and krill, just like the crab you're gonna see with those, right? So the baleen up close, you can feel it. it. It looks like hair, but it's actually really tough, right? And it's for filter feed, right? That's what baleen looks like. <clears throat> so baleen whales, they filter feed. And it's really interesting that such a big animal eats such tiny things in the ocean. But at the same time, it makes sense because based off trophic pyramid, how many plankton are there available in the ocean? A lot. A lot, a lot right? Plankton are really low on the trophic pyramid, so there's a lot. So if a whale comes along trying to eat plankton, it will never run out of food, right? It's always got a lot of plankton to eat. So by eating very low on the trophic pyramid, it increases its food supply and it itself is able to become really big. Right? And the same thing actually happens on land too, right? Look on the African savanna, right? The biggest animals, are they predators or are they herbivores? <coughs> herbivores. herbivores, right? The giraffe, right? Um, the buffalo, the elephant, the rhino, all of those, and the hippo, they're all bigger than lions and leopards, right? And hyenas, those ones are a lot smaller. And that's partly due to the fact that they eat plants. There's more plants available, so they have a bigger food source they're able to get. Whereas lions, they have to eat animals, and there's not nearly as many animals as there are plants to eat. So it doesn't actually give as much energy. Right. Okay, so anyways, baleen whales, right? They get big because they eat very low on the trophic pyramid, and they um, come in a lot of varieties, right? Yeah. Here are probably the four most important uh, baleen whales, right? Humpback whale, most iconic whale, right? You've got videos of them reaching, you've got the really long pectoral fins, right? Gray whale, what we have here on our coast, California coast. Over here we have blue whale, the biggest whale, biggest animal that we have right now. And of course the say whale, which is the most hunted whale in the world, hmm. right? Judging by its name, which country do you think it's from? Japan. Japan, exactly. Right, Japan just started um, catching whales again. Right, they legalize whaling again. Yeah, what do you guys think about that? I don't know. Not super great. Not super great. I mean, totally agree. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's a lot of other organisms that are in need of protection. Right, there's a lot of animals that we hunt, there's a lot of animals that we trade. And although whaling is pretty sad. I do think there's a, a lot of other things that could probably benefit more from support, right? For example, I'm a pretty utilitarian person and something like a top predator, like a tiger or something, that would probably be much more useful to support, right? Whereas a whale, if you guys think about what a whale eats, like then yeah. it doesn't really change the ecosystem too much if we lose the whale. Of course, there's probably a bunch of unseen 
factors that we don't know yet, right? But on a purely trophic stance, whales are might not be as important as we think, right? There might be other animals that are or organisms that are probably much more important. So, for example, I'd say forests, right? Um, forests is probably more important than whales are, um, and then like I said, top predators and stuff like that. So, it's not like I'm for whaling or anything. But I think we need to come up with some more, like, some better arguments, right? Some better arguments rather than it's sad, right? Maybe come with some more informed uh, use cases for whales or something like that, right? Well, um, but then again, the reopening of whaling might be a good thing because it means, or hopefully it means, it usually means that the populations have gone up. Right, so that's another possible thing, right? So the Endangered Species Act is something in which if you list a species, that means it is critically endangered, right? But the goal of the Endangered Species Act and all the conservationists is to take species off of the list. If you put species on the list, that means you're failing in your mission, that all the animals are becoming endangered, right? So we should be striving to take things off the list that means that they're doing better. So by you know making whaling legalized, maybe it's a sign that their populations are increasing. So who knows? Could be could be wrong. Right. But I guess it is kind of sad, right? Because whales are intelligent, right? But then in that case we're operating on a more intrinsic stance rather than utilitarian. Right. Okay, well anyways, you know that's what we think. Gotta move on. Talk about the other type of whale, toothed whales. Like right? toothed whales are dolphins, right? Look at this dolphin. Look at its teeth. What do dolphins eat? Fish. 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 Small, slippery Sleep. fish, just like pinnipeds, right? Sea mm -hmm. lions and stuff like that. Okay, so we got these toothed whales eating the fish, right? We see them feeding the fish all the time. They like to go around and chase them. They don't like to eat big things because they don't have the necessary teeth for that. Right? Okay. Um, before we talk about dolphins, I want to get one important tooth whale out of the way. It's the sperm whale, right? The sperm whale is a tooth whale. It's got teeth. It doesn't eat plankton. It's big. It doesn't eat plankton, though. It actually eats squid. Squid. giant squid, right? Giant squid from the deep sea, right? It dives all the way down and eats a giant squid. The giant squid is 20 or 30 feet long, huge mollusk, right? It has suckers, and the suckers have like spikes on them, right? So if you guys can see the mouth, see all these things, right? What are those? Uh, scars. Yeah, exactly. So scars from um, fighting with squid. squids, squid. right? Yeah, I mean the squid never wins, but <laughs> it leaves some scars for sure. Right? Moby Dick was a sperm whale, basically. <clears throat> So anyways, dolphins, right? Let's talk about dolphins. Um, I'm gonna show you a really interesting fact that blew my mind as a kid. Killer whales are dolphins, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know why this blew my mind so much because I just always assumed it was a whale because I had killer in its <coughs> name. But I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, it's skin is smooth like a dolphin's, right? Dolphins are smooth and whales are kind of wrinkly and tough. But anyways, this is the biggest dolphin. If you guys can look at its scientific name, Orca, orca, maybe we'll get where we got the word orca from. It turns out it is the species of its scientific name, right? So this is the genus, that's the species, the species portion. Just like uh, the name octopus, right? You think that octopus, oh yeah, that's the eight-armed eight creature, right? Octopus is actually the genus of that group of orcas. Right, so sometimes our common names come straight from the scientific name. Right? And then we get, here's a male, here's a female. What sexually dimorphic trait do you guys see? Hmm. The, the, the bigger dorsal fin. Yeah, difference in the dorsal fin height, right? Males have a much taller dorsal fin than a female does. Right? But uh, it's kind of sad because you guys see like killer whales when they're captive and stressed dorsal fin falls over and it just folds down 
right? Now that, personally, I think is actually sad, right? I mean, like, whaling is one thing, but holding dolphins and whales in captivity, in my opinion, is actually worse than whaling, right? Because, like, I guess it's the difference between slavery and murder, right? Which one's worse, right? Um, in this case, I don't know. I think uh, uh, holding them in captivity is worse because, like, their lifespans drastically reduced, right? They could live for 20 or more years, but in captivity, they only live for, like, two or three, right? They get stressed in a small pool and forced to do tricks, right? So are you against sea world? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's, that's a tricky situation because sea world also does a lot of good things, mm -hmm. right? Um, it does a lot of good things and it does some bad things, right? Uh, it's hard to say. But um, I do think, I don't know, I, I do think the dolphin thing is a little unnecessary. Right? <clears throat> okay, so yeah, um, whales in captivity, not usually a super good thing. But hey, uh, I guess it happens, right? It's just so sad because, you know, like whales are smart, right? They're social. So you take a few whales away from their pot, right? And it's, it's pretty traumatizing. And at the same time, you just wonder, if are they smart enough to know that they're slaves? I don't know, <laughs> they're being held captive? I don't, maybe they, they are, right? Because I'm going to show you an interesting video at the end of this. Um, but other than that, yeah, so whales. OK, um, whales in general, right? Breathing structures. Yeah, this is kind of like switching topics, right? Um, they have a blowhole. And I actually think this is one really cool, right? The baleen whale's blowhole has two holes, and it looks just like the nose. nose, right? Right. Whereas the tooth whale, the dolphin, has only one hole. That's the difference between the two. This enables them to breathe in which they expose their back to the surface. And, you know, that's really convenient. Why? So they can still see underwater. They can still see underwater. You remember, if you have to lift up your head above the water, it makes you vulnerable because you cannot see below. Well, this way, you can continue to see below while breathing. Right? That's good. Because you think about sea lions and seals, what are they getting attacked by all the time? Killer whales. Oh, uh, and killer whales and what? sharks, exactly, mm -hmm. right? Killer whales and gray whites always attacking those sea lions while they're breathing and stuff. Right? But over here we have whales and dolphins that don't need to worry about that quite as much as the whales. Right? You guys try it, right? Try going to the ocean and constantly having to lift your head above the water to get air. It's really, really uh, difficult, right? It's really annoying, that's what I gotta say. It's really annoying, it's tiresome, right? You just wanna stick your head down there, right? So that our human, that's why we have invented our human equivalent to a blowhole. Snorkel. Exactly, a snorkel enables you to look down while breathing at the same time, right? It's pretty simple, it saves a lot of energy. <clears throat> So the last thing that I wanted to get into for mammals is um, this last feature, intelligence, right? The possibility for intelligence is something that is afforded by one of their other attributes. Okay, let's see if we can figure it out, right? We have, you know, organism displaying curiosity, able to learn tricks. Why is that? Why are they so smart? Take a look at the six smartest animals on Earth. Right here they are. What do they all have in common? They're not in the same class. They have brains. Well, I mean, I mean, like worms have brains. They are, and that they're, okay. they're terrestrial, okay. But, I mean, this is not terrestrial. Mm -hmm. So. They care for the young. They care for the young. Actually, yeah, they all do that. But that is not why they're smart, though. What, are they, what else do they have in common? Um, Something that we learned earlier today. Yeah, what did all of these things have in common? They're all warm birds. blooded. That's an animal, what was that? They're all warm blooded. They're all warm blooded, exactly. See, warm bloodedness not only affords you high intensity activities, but it also high affords, yeah, exactly, increased intelligence or capability for intelligence, right? Um, I'm not saying it's impossible to be intelligent if you're cold blooded, but it's very rare, right? There are a few intelligent cold blooded animals, octopus, stuff like that, 
but it's very, very rare, right? Um, in general, if something's intelligent, it is probably a warm-blooded creature, like would be a bird or a mammal, right? Not to say that all birds or mammals are intelligent, that's not true, right? We have plenty of mammals that are not very intelligent, right? There's even many primates that are not very intelligent, right? The earlier ones. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, intelligence is afforded by warm blood, and <coughs> that's one of the perks, right? One of the perks of being warm blood. So, in addition to high intensity activities, you could also be smart, and that's good because, you know, considering how, how much energy warm blood takes, it's good to have additional features, right? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to show you guys a couple videos and examples of intelligence, right? The first one is <laughs> CRs, right? CRs are their tool use. You guys know how they build dams, you know, rocks. Exactly, right. They eat sea urchins and crabs, as you guys can see, and those are hard shelled things, so they got to get them open. But they don't bite them open, right? They just break it on their chest. I didn't know they did this before. I used to think their chest was just super hard. You know, when I was a kid, I just thought they had a super hard chest and then like doing that. But then someone told me, it was like, no, actually, they found a rock and they put it on their chest and then they're beating it against the rock. Oh. Right? So, did you know that? No. Oh, okay. So you thought that they had a hard chest too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. But anyways, turns out it's because they know how to use rocks to break open prey. So that's pretty cool, right? They're, here they are breaking up this dungeonish crab, as you guys can see here. But I'm going to show you this picture. Sometimes the crab wins. Look at oh, that. Oh, my God. Is that like inside his eye? I don't know, but it looks like it. Yeah, <laughs> oh. yeah that's, that's some crazy stuff. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, so anyways, tool use, right, as exhibited in the CRs, right? Continuing on, let's look at some interesting behavioral adaptations, or what do you want to call it, for these dolphins that live inside this lagoon. So you see the fish flopping around, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll show you again in slow motion right now. Okay, um, did you guys see the school of fish? Yeah. Right in mm -hmm. front, and they're all chasing right after. And there they are, forcing all these fish onto oh. land. Yeah, so they're all scanning them onto the shore and then snapping them up while they're on the shore because it is easier to pick up a fish on land than it is to pick up the fish oh in the water, yeah. right? So that they've all learned this behavior and they learned to work together to catch fish easily, right? And this is interesting for two reasons, right? One of the reasons is, look, these dolphins, they lie on one side in order to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And when they lie on one side, the bottom set of teeth versus the top set of teeth, one of them crunches up on sand while the other one's in air. So the one that crunches on the sand actually gets worn down. And by looking at their different dolphin jaws, you could get a sense of left or right handedness oh. in these dolphins because they choose in left which side that they gonna... usually oh, go okay. and they prefer a certain side. Or sorry, a certain side, right? They prefer a certain side to get onto shore. Right, so that's pretty interesting. They actually have left or right handedness. And then the second thing that's cool is in the beginning, if you guys saw, it said that this behavior is not observed anywhere else. What that means is this is a learned technique of just this one area. It's not in their genes, yeah. right? It's not instinctive. They learn to do this themselves and they don't have any 
long distance means of transportation, so they cannot communicate with other dolphins, right? If they could communicate with the rest of the world, then they might spread this knowledge, right? Um, but it's only found here. And how do dolphins end up doing this year after year after year? The, even the young dolphins know how to do this. Because, they teach them. yeah, they teach them, right? They have like a, almost like a oral learning tradition, right? It's not like they talk, but they, they watch, right? And they teach and they learn. So it's pretty cool. Okay, next video. This is probably one of the craziest things. Like, personally, I find this one of the craziest things I've ever seen. That's the crazy thing that I wanted to show you guys, all right? So like, what's going on here? Here's two dolphins ganging up on a dolphin of a different species, right? I don't know about you, but that is creepy. Okay, that's just absolutely insane. Like, here's the thing, there are dolphins here, right? Um, the bottlenose dolphin recognizes that this is a dolphin. But at the same time, it knows that it's not equal to itself. Mm -hmm. And it believes it to be greater than that dolphin, right? And not just this dolphin as an individual, but that dolphin as a group, right? right? So it's like a form of racism, right? But more like speciesism, right. right? It's really insane that you have like two different species of dolphins and they can recognize that they're both dolphins, but one of them believes itself to be better than the other, right? Mm -hmm. And it knows that it's not the same kind as it, right? That's just, that just blows my mind because if you think about it, that we've never had to experience that on our own, right? Um, if we saw another species of human, then how would we deal with that, right? That would be really crazy. And when we look at something like a chimpanzee, we're different enough that most people are like, oh yeah, I'm definitely smarter than the chimpanzee. Like, it's no question, but this one, right, it's a little bit <clears throat> more similar, right? So we never had to deal with that personally. And if you look at a lesser intelligent organism, like a shark, right? Let's just say you had like a hammerhead shark here and like a tiger shark over there and they meet each other. Well, the bigger one is just gonna think the smaller one is food, right? It doesn't know that the other one's a shark. It doesn't care that it's a shark. It's just another animal, right? But in this case, it knows this other individual is a dolphin, right? And it bullies it, right? You know, to exert dominance. That's, that's like really, that's, I don't know, that's really scary, you know? That's really uh, creepy in my opinion. That they, that, yeah, you know, they, they know what they're doing. You it's know, they know like, that racism is like natural. Oh, maybe not natural, but it's not uniquely human. So um, the next video is about humans. So let's take a look at this. You guys can try if you want. Yeah. <laughs> this is really great. One last breath. His heartbeat 
it slows to around 30 beats per minute. The pressure at these depths crushes his chest, squeezing the air in his lungs to one third of its usual volume. Even without weights, he's negatively buoyant enough to stride across the bottom of the sea as if hunting on land. So that's pretty crazy, right? That's crazy in a lot of ways. First of all, uh, this, he wasn't using any like equipment, right? He only had goggles, right? Those mask or snorkel. Um, he didn't even use fins. That is like probably the craziest thing, in my opinion, because if he used fins on his feet, he would be able to get down there like three times faster. I bet. Like if he was going just with his legs and his feet. It wasn't super efficient, right? If you were using fins, it would probably be. You know, a lot easier, right? Second of all, if you guys saw, he he went like seventy feet, and he went all that walked along the bottom just for that tiny fish, right? I don't know. In, in my opinion, that wasn't like worth it. But that is pretty crazy. He's part of a tribe of people in, um, you know, the Pacific Islands, and there's a tribe of people in the islands that have, you know, done diving for so long in the past that they've actually genetically adapted to being good at diving. Mm -hmm. Like, they have, their blood can probably carry more oxygen than normal people, and also their eyes are better at seeing underwater than normal people can, like wow. without goggles and stuff. So it's, it's really interesting, like they actually have like adaptations inside their genes to make them good at diving. <clears throat> like, <clears throat> okay. Cool. And then the last video I want to show you guys is a personal video of mine, so let's, let me just get to it real quick. Alright, so this is my Instagram, and I wanted to show you what did I used to do. Alright, so I know I don't look like it, but I'm a skateboarder, and uh, <laughs> I like to... Yeah, um, I like to design skateboard grip tape art, so like this for example, right? And you just draw on top of the grip tape and you cut it out. And you use like the negative space to create an image, right? But the one that I want to show you guys is, where did it go? Nope. Crab. Uh, there's a lot of crab in here. That mm -hmm. is true. Um, where did it go? Oh my God, crabs. There it is. Look, see this? It's a dolphin, right? Here's the dolphin on the top and here's the dolphin on the bottom. I drew this on there because um, there's a skateboard trick called the dolphin flip. And it's the only skateboard trick that has a CM name, right? So I decided to work really hard and learn it. And here it is. So pay attention to the dolphin on the board. It looks like it's flipping. Okay, that one's hard, but the next one, you can see it. Oh, Sam, do you guys see it? The dolphin was flipping. <clears throat> okay, so that's a dolphin flip. And then recently I just came back from Canada. And I wanted to get a clip of me doing the dolphin flip in Canada. So I was like, what is the perfect place? Of course, 
the Vancouver Aquarium with this dolphin <laughs> statue. So I decided to real quick do a dolphin pose. Dude, he almost crashed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there you go, dolphins, right? And then that's the end of our lecture. Okay, cool. So we just finished covering all of the marine argument, uh, marine chordata, right? We got all the way from A. Natha up to mammalia. Finish our discussion of marine mammals and kind of dolphins and all that stuff. Okay. So any questions on this stuff? Everybody doing all right? Pretty easy, right? Names are getting a little bit easier, maybe, right? I think the only key terms we had was pinniped and cetacean, right? If you know those, then you're pretty good. And everything else is pretty easy, like toothed whale, right? Baleen whale, babes. A little bit tricky, chondrichthys, osteichthys. Well, those are old, though. You guys should have them done. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Cool.